Avaya has changed my life. Avaya has made me the woman I am today. Avaya is my home. Avaya is personal freedom. Avaya is the reason my life continuously improves. Let everyone in your life know about Avaya. Everyone needs to know about this amazing company. Thank you, Avaya, for appearing in my inbox. What Ike Allen and Andy Anderson have created at Avaya is what the world needs. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Padgett, and welcome to Avaya's Overcoming Depression and Loneliness Curriculum. Thank you so much for joining us. Our fellow teacher, Hilary Jacobs Hendel, is here with us today to talk about preventing, easing, and healing depression using the change triangle and the transformational power of core emotions. An award winning author and developer of the change triangle tool for emotional health, Hilary takes the complex world of emotions and makes them easy to understand and work with for greater peace, calm, and confidence. Hillary is a certified psychoanalyst and AED, AEDP psychotherapist for couples and individuals. She has published articles in the New York Times, Time Magazine, Oprah, Salon, and professional journals. Hillary has also consulted on the psychological development of characters on AMC's Mad Men, and, and her blog on emotions, relationships, and trauma is read worldwide. Thank you for being with us, Hillary. Thanks, Ashley. I'm very happy to be here talking about my favorite subject, emotions. <laughs> yes. So please tell us, why are you so passionate about, passionate about educating people about emotions? Well, it really, it all started with sort of my, my, own, my own journey and, and the fact that we're all raised in a culture where we really don't get any emotion education. There isn't a lot of emphasis on emotions except sort of how to like get past them or rise above them or yeah. push them down or avoid them like the plague. And, um, and so, you know, I'm a product of that, of that society that we're all in. And so when I started to train, I went back to social work school at the age of 39 later in life after having been a dentist in my first career and then floundered around for 10 years. And, um, and I always knew I wanted to be a, a therapist, but I didn't have the confidence until I was older because I didn't know what I would have to offer sort of in my 20s. And then when I went back to school, um, it was sort of as I expected. I, I knew social work school was sort of two years of general stuff. And then I had planned to go into psychoanalytic training because in New, New York City, that was kind of the, the most educated you could be. I really wanted to be the best therapist that I could be. I was a perfectionist in many ways and yes. in education. And then along the way, a friend of mine recommended that I listen to this woman, Diana Fosha, who had developed this new method that was emotion-based psychotherapy, but also attachment-based and had a trauma-informed uh, bent to it. And I had never really, I didn't, I hadn't heard of these things before. I didn't even know there was information on emotions. And despite the fact that I was really steeped in, in science throughout my life and biological sciences and how the brain and the body worked, but really there was not really a course that I had on emotions. So when I began, when I went to this um, conference, that was my first exposure uh, conference on emotions and attachment with very famous researchers like Dan Siegel was there and Diana Fosha, this person that I had set out to see um, and Tom Stern, who was a researcher in infant, infant mother research and all these prestigious people. I learned this entire world of that there was a science on how emotions work in the mind and most especially in the body. And they put up a picture of this triangle that at the time was um, part of the academic literature. It was called the triangle of experience and it mapped the diagram between these things, this category of emotions that were physical and that were adaptive, if you allowed them to be, that were core emotions, which were anger, sadness, fear, disgust, joy, excitement, sexual excitement, these kind of core feelings that as I share with people now, they're sort of, if you have to judge something as selfish, these are the selfish emotions. They're all about what's good for me and what's bad for me, what scares me, what what makes me feel angry because I feel attacked, what makes me feel joy, what makes me want to move towards something, what makes me want to 
be sort of repulsed by something. And that these core emotions had these kind of very special qualities that when you allowed them to, when you allowed them to come up and out, they informed you about something in the environment that was important and they happened very quickly. Sometimes they were very intense and overwhelming, but that when you, when one learns not to be afraid of them and listen to them and ride the wave, right? Because they come up and they're like waves. If you ride the wave, then your body and mind return to a calmer state and you can make use of that information. But what most of us were, are taught is really, we get scared when we start to feel a feeling and we sort of intellectualize it, we go up into our heads. And so this triangle kind of symbolized that that if you imagine a triangle superimposed on your body with the tip of it, it's upside down. Yes. It's sort of in your core, if you can sort of see right here, yes. my, my heart and my stomach. And that's where the core emotions kind of all are ready. We're born with them ready to kind of ignite when we need them, right? They respond to the environment. Yes. And then when they come up and we have no conscious control, which is something I didn't know. I thought, sorry, I thought we were supposed to be able to control our emotions. And I thought yeah. in fact that mind over matter was a fact. And in fact, it's really a myth that we can't control emotions. We can only control what we do with them once they're triggered because they're triggered in the limbic system in the brain, a part that we don't have conscious control of. And for a very good reason, we, we want them to be fast acting because they're survival emotions. So if you had to think your way through a feeling, it would be too slow to really escape danger very quickly. So, you know, if like if something dangerous is happening, our heart starts to pump and, and uh, we, we react very quickly to get to safety. And it's only after we're safe that we begin to can think about, oh my God, something just, you know, scared me to death. So, so these are, we're sort of on the bottom of the triangle, depending on what's going on in life. And these days with the pandemic and yes. politics, we're triggered a lot of emotions, but when we block them, instead of moving through them and down to a calm state, right at the bottom of the triangle, and I'll pull up a picture of this in a minute, we, we, we learn to, to avoid them with this other category of emotions called inhibitory emotions. And I think what I'll do is I'll share this screen really fast. Yes, um, please. With, uh, so people can see this. Because this is what got me passionate about, what passionate about emotions. Um, right, so down here are these important emotions that we want to kind of learn how to experience again. And when we cut them off, we do this with these inhibitory emotions that are anxiety, guilt, and shame. And each of these inhibitory emotions in their own special torturous way um, are able to uh, not only push down with energy, like just imagine anxiety, we feel tension in our body. Yes. All that muscular tension is really, and like stopping of breathing, you know, holding our breath, all of that is really literally pushing these body-based experiences, these core emotions from coming up. So it's really like a suppressing and a squashing. And shame has his own way of doing that, which we're going to talk about because the topic is depression and loneliness. And shame is very important to understand when we're trying to understand feelings of depression and feelings of loneliness. And then, of course, guilt, right? We, we feel maybe we'll feel angry at, our, at somebody we love, and then the guilt comes up. I shouldn't feel that way. And it pushes it down. And then the top left corner of the triangle is um, our defenses, which by definition is anything we do to avoid feeling emotional pain or discomfort. And defenses are not meant in AEDP, this type of therapy that I do, to be pejorative. They're really brilliant, creative ways that we protect ourselves from feeling uncomfortable and feeling pain. And defenses are anything from very kind of soft, as we call them, you know, gentle defenses, like shrugging our shoulders, like a moment ago, Ashley, I gave you a compliment and, you know, <laughs> you said, oh, I'm going to blush. And, you know, <laughs> hey, that's a little bit of shame coming up, a little bit of embarrassment, which, which blocks the, the expansiveness that, um, that feeling pride, you know, in yourself or really being able to receive, um, a compliment might take. So, and then defenses ramp up into, you know, 
uh, reaching for a drink when we're uncomfortable, to um, we can be angry as a defense as much as it can be a core emotion. Uh, you know, we might feel vulnerable and sad, and yet we'll get angry and crusty over it. And I have a whole list of defenses on, on my website, which I'll talk about later, so people can start to recognize the way that we defend and block against emotions. Yes. So when I saw this triangle that mapped out the relationship between the way I avoided emotions, the anxiety that I felt, my authentic true emotions, and this kind of open-hearted calm state that's underneath the triangle where we all want to spend more time, it's like a light bulb went off and I was like instantly organized for my own mental health. And I had been anxious for a lot of my life and the way that I coped with my anxiety, a healthy defense was being very productive. And I just kept going and kept going and I knew how I wanted my life to turn out. I wanted to get <clears throat> to do well in school and have a successful career. I wanted to get married. I wanted to have children and I ticked off each one before I knew all this stuff that I'm talking about now and ended up, you know, on sort of autopilot without tuning in to my fears and ambivalences because the go, go, go is how I managed my anxiety. And then of course I ended up in, in a career that wasn't right for me. I ended up being a dentist and that's a long story I won't bore you with. And even though I got a lot out of my education and I learned neuroscience at Columbia from Eric Kandel, who won the, Neuro, the Nobel Peace Prize for, for neuroscience. So I, my education has served me in what I'm doing now. You know, I wasted a lot of time and money on the, on the wrong career. I ended up with my first marriage getting divorced. And that of course caused great pain for, for my children. And even though I'm happy that I had my children and happy that I, I was young so that I could, you know, grow old with them as adults, each of these kind of mistakes I attribute to really not being in tune with my anxiety and the emotions that were coming up and telling me, were cueing me that there was something else I needed to listen to inside me. And so understanding my anxiety had meaning. And even I went through a few depressions myself when I was getting divorced and it's like, I just had so much stress and I kept going and going. And it was really the first time that I experienced a clinical depression that I was humbled realizing, okay, I can't just not tune into how I'm feeling and go, go, go. Yes. That was the beginning of really learning about myself that I had to take care of myself. So at that point, I started to slow down. I still hadn't learned this information on emotions, it, but it was only after I saw the change triangle and started to practice it in my own work that I became aware of the many fears that I had underneath and that I had now some power to process those fears, to make sense of them and to actually feel better. And really since I started learning the since I learned the change triangle and became an AEDP therapist of which this is derived um, and engaged in this type of work myself on a personal level that I never, I haven't experienced another, I had two, two depressions, two bouts about five years apart and I hadn't uh, had another one. And it makes perfect sense because again, depression is a, is a symptom and it's the beginning of a story that something happened that needs tending and what happened are events that caused overwhelming emotions to come up probably and mostly for in the, uh, us in the face of too much aloneness. So we can't process them because when you were overwhelmed, humans are wired to be in connection for soothing and for processing of emotions, particularly for the parents out there when babies are young and they're emotionally overwhelmed, they, they, they don't have a self soothing capacity. They need to be soothed by an adult that has soothing capacity. And if we grew up with adults that themselves were depressed or unable to calm themselves down, and then we got upset, they couldn't calm us down. And then that's the story of intergenerational trauma, trauma in the sense of these invisible traumas that we don't hear about much that caused this epidemic of anxiety and depression. And those invisible traumas have to do with emotional disregard, emotional neglect, that we don't have a language to talk about emotions, that parents aren't given emotion education so that we can they can learn how to attune 
to their child if it doesn't come naturally and that we all don't learn how to attune to each other and speak to each other in a, in a language of, a, of emotions along with our rational thoughts, right? It's yeah. not one or the other. We need both to get the full picture of our who we are, what we want, what we need, and to be able to communicate that in constructive ways. Absolutely. That's learning all that that blew me away and that made me passionate, not only about becoming that type of therapist, but then my sort of hobby that came out of that was the pet peeve, which turned into a moral outrage that we don't get any, the public doesn't get any emotion education. And so I extracted this triangle from AEDP theory, which was grounded in neuroscience very firmly in science because I'm a science nerd at heart and um, wanted to just share that the basics of the triangle and how everybody can really learn about emotions and begin to understand themselves better and each other better. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you so much for bringing that together in an inter interdisciplinary fashion, because that that's really where we begin to, to find the, these ideas, you know, this conversation that, that leads to, to new ways and new, you know, necessary ways to think about these things. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it relates to loneliness. Yes. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about the connection between depression, loneliness, and shame? Yeah. So, um, and again, for, for people interested, I, I would point you to an article that in the New York Times that was published in 2015 called, It's Not Always Depression, Sometimes It's Shame. That, that I wrote because um, again, I had no education in my therapy training nor in my social work school on shame. It really was not mentioned. I don't, I'm, I'm wondering whether they talk about it more now in school. And when, so I was seeing patients um, in the psychoanalytic institute that where I was being taught psychoanalysis, which is much more of a sit back and listen and don't kind of interject and to be kind of quiet was the way my supervision was, you know, say less, say less. And what happens is that people who have trauma, particularly emotional neglect, by definition, create shame. I mean, there's, there's, there's shame. We, everybody has shame. That's the first thing to understand about shame, but it's, it's unique for all of us. It's learned in a context. So again, we come primed with all these core emotions ready to be evoked in response to the environment to keep us safe. But we also become primed with inhibitory emotions like shame and guilt that are meant to socialize and civilize us. So what keeps our selfishness in check are these inhibitory emotions that when we have them in small amounts at the right times, they teach us lessons and they teach us morality and that we shouldn't hurt people if we can help it. And we, we shouldn't kill people just because we're angry at them. Oh. <laughs> from people just because we might cut what they want, right? But what happens again, because of a lack of emotion education that's needed in modern times, because we're not all just out foraging for food and shelter. Right now we have time to think and be, is that um, when we are, when we are, when our emotions are disregarded because our parents again don't have the education they have love and good intention um that's experienced as an as an insult and you know one of the most crushing insults are kids that are filled with natural exuberance and let's say they have um, parents that are overwhelmed Let's say they have parents who are depressed and, and if you're in the, a spontaneous moment of exuberance and you are met with criticism or disdain uh, or indifference, the pushback from that, if you want to think of it as this outward energy and the immediate pushback from an outside source, that energy kind of implodes back into us and creates like a shaming experience. And before the shame, though, there's a moment of anger or rage, of protest. Yes. And, but that eventually gets snuffed out because the brain starts to learn very quickly how to avoid the experience of rejection, which is to stay small. 
And so that, that shaming experience, which is a massive amount of energy kind of ricocheting back in almost like a turtle retreating into a shell, we get stuck there and we get stuck there because it's safe and it might be safe and uncomfortable, but safe and uncomfortable, the brain prefers to vulnerable and perhaps having some new and novel experiences. So when patients come into me in this article that I wrote for the New York Times, the reason I was, it was the first time I was moved to really write something about this type of work was because this, this guy, Brian, which was a, a pseudonym, came after being treated for decades for what they called treatment resistant depression. You're a difficult patient. They tried every type of therapy. He had cocktails of medications. You know, he had CBT and DBT and uh, supportive therapy and a host of psychiatrists and numerous psychiatric hospitalizations. And when I met him, he was like practically catatonic. And the next step for him was going to be electroshock therapy, which he didn't want. And by luck ended up in the Institute. Uh, no, actually he, I think he started when I was like starting AEDP. This was a while ago. Anyway, I, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So I treated him with this trauma theory, AEDP, and he got better. And I, I was so blown away, even though I had seen so many videotapes, because that's how we learn in AEDP, by, by training with videotaping sessions, because you, you, you don't work by listening as much as you do by tracking moment-to-moment nonverbal behavior. Um, but when he got better, just from working this triangle in the, in the sort of, in the safe connection, right? So to work on, on our vulnerable feelings, we need to feel really, really safe and like yeah. we're not going to be judged and we're not going to be re-humiliated. And we're going to have someone that really wants to be connected and can tolerate big emotions that we're actually trying to look for. So basically this was um, someone that I, what I would now call had a shame-based depression. And the way that he recovered was by working that triangle where we try to transform and move over the shame or get to know the, the young parts that are filled with shame so they can feel seen and connected to, and then try to access the underlying rage from being ending up in this situation through no fault of his own and the mourning for years of his life lost. And through that process, the vitality comes back in because emotions contain all that energy. And so when you push down emotions, you get depressed. Depression is not an emotion. It's really a lack of emotional energy. It's a flat, flatlining of that. And shame is one of the ways that we get very depressed. Wow. So it wasn't a biochemical disorder, although there were certainly brain changes that happen from uh, neglect like the fear centers get bigger in the brain and the ability to put something into a memory gets smaller. But, um, but people, people do heal as opposed to just sort of getting insight. You, people really do change and transform. And, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I can no, talk. you're fine. You're fine. No, that's so good. Yeah. That's so good. I was just, happy. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just going to connect the dots then between shame is a very lonely state. And even if we want to connect and we all want to connect because we're wired for connection and connection feels good unless there are parts of us that have been sort of wired to feel that people are dangerous, it's usually young parts, or that they're not worthy of connection or that they will be rejected if they get connected. And so a lot of loneliness is really really just validating the the wounds of our life and through surviving our childhood what we had to do to survive that now keep us more alone and isolated and that's that is healable through uh, a safe relationship whether it's with a therapist or any type of counselor or any type of wonderful person in our life that really makes space for us to try to step in this to this new place to to be more real with these feelings and that are underneath our depression and shame. So 
tell us what are some of the benefits of tapping into our emotions? Well, they're, they're numerous, but I wonder if first, I just want to validate that it's not an easy thing to do, particularly because emotions hurt many of them, even positive emotions. When um, part of the way that we work in AEDP is we really preference positive emotions and we try to build what's called receptive affective capacity, which is the ability to receive, if we go back to a compliment again, yeah. what does it mean to take in uh, something good that has happened to us and actually feel that expansive energy in our core. You actually feel bigger, right? And that's not an easy thing to do because when we're bigger, we are, it feels like we're more exposed, like we could be cut down. And if that happened a lot, or even just evolutionarily, if we feel above the fray, you could get shot. <laughs> Brain has a negative propensity that we we sort of fight against to create positive neuroplasticity, um, and so that we can feel bigger and more confident. And that's how you create more confidence is by really trying to sit with positive affect emotion that's coursing through the body, energy of expansiveness. And so it takes some coaching and some some you know anxiety comes up and then we stop and, and lower the anxiety and then go back to trying to feel expansive it's sort of it's kind of a pendulating or a titrating back and forth and so um one of the benefits then of learning to be with emotions is one you, you're not frightened of them anymore and therefore you get to experiment like after years of doing this when i get hit with an emotion instead of going up into my head and obsessing or ruminating like i used to I've sort of retrained my brain. I now go into my body and I'm like, hmm, what's this strange sensation here? And, you know, I try to figure out the core emotions that I have. I try to figure out what's in the anxiety, if it's anxiety, if it's shame, what brought up that shaming experience, if it's guilt, whatnot. And um, it's, it's not too dissimilar when you begin to work with emotions to stubbing your toe where you know there's a moment you stub your toe and you don't feel the pain yet and then you know it's coming and then it crescendos like a wave. And then, <laughs> okay, it's gonna go down soon. And that's kind of what these emotions are like, they're wave-like. But when we build a capacity to feel them, they are our energy. The benefits are they fill us with vitality. So when we're feeling, we feel alive. They're also a compass for living. Like if we don't, a lot of people struggle with anger and um, makes sense because we don't get any anger education. People equate feeling angry with bad behaviors. But when you start to understand emotions, when you get an actual lesson, because we need an actual lesson in emotions, um, I teach people that there's a difference between having the experience of a feeling that's just wholly an internal bodily experience of strange sensations like anger. You, again, you feel a lot of energy come up you might feel some heat in your belly. You might feel some tightness in your jaw. But nothing has actually happened. It's, it's acting out is when you take that, that angry energy, you don't pause and reflect on it, and you just act mean or you hit or you do you know, destructive things. And that's, this is about the opposite. It's about being able to slow that process down so when it's still in your body, you can listen to what it's telling you and then bring rational thought and common sense online, and this is a practice over a lifetime for sure, of what do I do with this anger? Does it mean I have to say no and set a boundary or set a limit? Does it mean that I realize that this particular person in my life is not good for me because they're, they're constantly insulting me? And so I've, I've, I've been here before. I've felt this type of fury before. It's like, I don't want it anymore. So that anger. So if I didn't feel, if we didn't feel angry, we wouldn't know when we were being attacked or intruded upon, violated in some way. So it's really crucial for protection. Um, and if we didn't feel sadness over loss, we really wouldn't feel love either. That sadness is a really difficult emotion and people are frightened of it, but we don't have to be frightened of it. It's just, it's just a feeling and it's hurts but we don't have to be frightened if you become familiar with those sensations of heaviness. And we can instead, instead of burying it, 
which can lead to depression and can lead to anxiety, we can soothe it and tend to it and care for it like we're our own loving parent. We're taking care of ourselves. So there's all the reasons in the world to understand and begin to work with emotions that are for well-being and wellness. And really, we should not be learning to bury our emotions. It doesn't mean that we can't distract ourselves, but you want it. There's the awareness. Right. So it's not like wearing your emotions on your sleeve all the time. It's not like that. It's not like this is work for an excuse to rage or an excuse to cry at work, you know, and to be unprofessional. It's about being able to, to tolerate what we're experiencing without burying it or avoiding it. And then listening to what those feelings are telling us and then thinking about whether we want to express them, whether we just need to process them on our own, whether we need to go to a therapist to work with younger parts that we can't do it alone because it's too scary or too hard or because we, you know, we keep going into too much anxiety and really just being a full integrated person using thoughts, feelings, being able to stay in the body and not dissociate and, um, and just accept who we are and what's happened to us and then move forward with verve and, and vitality for living. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for sharing that perspective. I, I, I know this is, this is something that I myself have been working on and struggling through and coming to, you know, over the past few years, just with my own things. So I know how vital it is to to get the information that you're sharing with us right now. Yeah. Um, and we are running low on time. So I would like to remind everyone viewing that there are several buttons below this video. And when you click on them, they will lead you to resources that Hillary has for you, as well as her book. Uh, can you tell everyone about those, please? Yeah, well, basically with this kind of, this enthusiasm that I have for educating people about emotions, I um, I had the opportunity, actually after that New York Times article came out, I was asked to write more on the subject, which is very rare and I'm so grateful for that. And um, so when um, when I was an, asked by an agent, what do I write or what do I want to write on? I said, well, there was this triangle that I just thought everybody should know. And when I learned it, I started teaching my family and friends about it. So basically, and it's a great tool to teach emotions. So this book is an easy to read. There's no jargon in it. It's just an emotion education in a book. It's everything you ever wanted to know about a practical use to understand your emotions and how they work in the mind and the body. And we follow along with my patients. I, it's mostly stories from my practice of how people shift from depression and chronic anxiety and social anxiety and PTSD and trauma, moving from those defended and avoidant states through the inhibitory emotions down to the core emotions. It's very tender and, and emotional to read and process these emotions um, to get to this open-hearted state that's underneath the triangle where we're calm and curious and compassionate to ourselves and compassionate to others and more creative, again, just more filled with, with energy. And so the book has gentle exercises. So you basically you're working the change triangle along with me and the purpose of it is really to provide an emotion education. So that's, no one has to do anything more than just have the information, which will help you understand other people and yourself better. Or you can begin to, through the, I wanted to give people a vicarious experience because it's much less scary to do something when you see other people do it first. Yes. So it's very vivid of being a fly on the wall in a therapist's office for what it looks like to process fully an emotion? What does it look like to process rage from your childhood? How does that energy come up and out safely? And what does that look like? What does it look like to sit with someone that's in deep grief? And so you get a vicarious experience. And then hopefully, if you want, you get to dip your toe in the water by trying out these exercises at the end of each section to get to, get to know yourself a little bit better. And then, um, so it's really a self-help book, but it's also a book book a lot of people bring to their therapist who want to begin to work this way 
And um, it's a book I would recommend couples to read together. It's a book that I recommend that parents read together so that they don't unwittingly, right, by accident, create anxiety and shame in their children by avoiding emotions that they don't understand themselves, which I felt very guilty of. Like, I wish I had had this book that I wrote when I was 18 years old, and I would have made a lot less mistakes, I think. So that's, that's the main thing that unfortunately you have to buy because Random House and Penguin UK sells it. Yes. Every books are sold. The rest of the resources I, just, I create for the public for free because I'm just so passionate about sharing this information. So I have a blog and I'd love it if people wanted to sign up for my, um, for my blog. I send just a, an email once a month with a new article and uh, we can stay connected through, my, through that email if, if people want to, to sign up and get that. Uh, information and then there's the change triangle youtube channel and then all along my website at hillaryjacobshendel.com there's a toolbox section that gives you sort of videos on how to breathe through emotions and explains defenses and there's like a toolbox um, where i want people to take these resources teachers and parents and and use them as they wish uh, everybody can just take these things and share them and they're just they're free and they're to to dole out. And the Change Triangle YouTube channel is more geared towards videos, very short videos for people with short attention spans, <laughs> like many younger people, <laughs> or, uh, or full presentations on the Change Triangle, you know, for people that want more. Thank so, you so much. Yeah. Oh, and the free, the free gift oh, is free yes. if you want, for people that want to download a copy of the Change Triangle and the sort of Change Triangle cheat sheet, that's, that's also there. And I think it's in the toolbox section of the website. It says download the change triangle. So there are people that take that and laminate it or keep it in their wallet and they put their own, their own, they map out their own change triangle, which is what the book will show you how to do. So, you know, your sort of main culprits of where, where you feel uncomfortable with what emotions and getting to know those. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for offering these resources to our, to our viewers and and everyone that you can come in contact with. It's, it's, really, it's really just such a gorgeous thing to be that catalyst for information. And, and thank you for, for spending your time and, and, and learning about this so that you can share it and educate us. Because but as you say, it's, it's so needed. It's something that's been so neglected. Yes, no, and thank you. You know, this is what I love to do. So thanks for having me on and thanks to uh, Avaya University for having me back again and for I'm sure there are many, many other wonderful speakers to, to listen to as well. Avaya has changed my life. Avaya has made me the woman I am today. Avaya is my home. Avaya is personal freedom. Avaya is the reason my life continuously improves. Let everyone in your life know about Avaya. Everyone needs to know about this amazing company. Thank you, Avaya, for appearing in my inbox. What Ike Allen and Andy Anderson have created at Avaya is what the world needs. 